So welcome back to the second panel of our military power seminar. And my name is Karsten Fries, and I had the pleasure to, to, to moderate this excellent panel. With me today, I have uh, the following speakers. Um, Natalia Torci, she is the director of Nupis History Institute in Italy, uh, uh, director of the Instituto Affari Internazionale. Sorry, my Italian is really bad. Uh, and also a special advisor uh, to the High Representative uh, uh, Joseph Borrell, the foreign policy, sorry, foreign policy uh, head of Europe, the foreign minister, if you like, of Europe or the European Union. Next is Sofia Besch. She's a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform. And then we have Professor Marianne Riedewal. She's part at NUPI, part professor at Inland University uh, in Norway. Welcome to all of you and looking forward to hear, hear your reflections. So we will do as a previous panels, uh, panel, I will invite you to, to give a kind of introductory remarks uh, and then we will have discussions and also open for, for Q&A from the audience. Uh, so Natalie, I will start with you. Welcome yet again. Um, as, as always, uh, when the Democrat is elected president, Europeans tend to like it, uh, but even more so, it's, it's a great enthusiasm now, relief, I would say, uh, after, after the election of over Joe Biden, over, over Trump. Now, uh, Wolfgang Isching in the previous panel said, curb your enthusiasm. Uh, of course, there are many good, many things will change to the positive, but you know, we're not going to go into some kind of a new wonderland. What's your take uh, on, on, on the new, on the election in the United States and the impact on Europe, please? Well, I think, Austin, um, I mean, I, I would agree with, with Wolfgang. I mean, I think, you know, obviously we shouldn't be little just how important uh, this election has been for the simple reason that we shouldn't be little just how bad the previous four years have been. Uh, and not because of policy disagreements. I mean, I think, you know, the transatlantic relationship has been through historical moments in which policy disagreements have been perhaps even more acute than they have been over the last four years. I mean, you know, from banana wars uh, through to the war in Iraq, you know, we've been through difficult times in, in the past. But I think never uh, in the past has there been a period such as this in which, um, you know, one thing is to disagree over something and quite another is to consider the other as another. I mean, disagreements in the past always took place within what, what was understood by both sides as being quote unquote family. Uh, and it has been this questioning, uh, in a sense, this sort of ideational questioning of, of, of who we are and the fact that maybe we are not family that has been so disruptive and, and, and so disconcerting, I think, over the last four years. So I think, you know, Quite aside from the policy uh, bit of the conversation, I think this fundamental shift of, of positioning uh, of, of the fact that basically we are playing in the same team, we may disagree at times, but we're basically on, on the same team is what, what will change in a very fundamental way. Having said that, I would agree with, with Wolfgang that this is not the time to lower our guard. Uh, and I think that the temptation is going to be to lower our guard because, uh, in a sense, this election has come, I would say, after more or less a year, year and a half, in which we have already been progressively lowering our guard. And at times, you know, and this is often being said, you know, for instance, when we talk about uh, COVID, you know, COVID is the great accelerator. I mean, normally events are historically significant to the extent that they tend to reinforce existing trends. And so in some respects, one can read this US, uh, US election uh, as being significant also because it reinforces an existing trend and in this case, not a particularly positive one. So I think already over the last year, as I said, we have been as Europeans lowering our guard. Uh, and, um, you know, whereas we had come from a period you know, if we take the sort of 2014 through to 2018 period uh, in which there was uh, a sort of confluence of different, uh, mainly exogenous factors, you know, from, uh, you know, crises in our neighbourhood uh, through to Brexit, through to the election of Donald Trump, uh, which all sort of converged into this, 
European debate of, hey, we have to assume great responsibility uh, and, you know, we can't simply take for granted that others read the United States of America is going to solve problem for us. Uh, and, and this had essentially led to the beginning of a debate uh, over strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, the writing of papers, the putting in motion of a number of instruments and mechanisms and funds and this and that and the other, all very good. Uh, and then we kind of start getting into 2018 and what do we end up doing? We kind of write more papers. Uh, and we have more debates <laughs> and, and this kind of goes on and, you know, you kind of wait for the action to happen and the action never really quite happens. But we keep on writing papers because you never know, there may be a crisis out there that will take place any moment now. And you kind of ask yourself and say, well, the crises have already happened, you know, what else are we waiting for? So I think, you know, there was already this sort of sagging momentum. Uh, when it came to European security and defence. On top of this, we have, the pan we have the pandemic, and I think the pandemic has had two effects, uh, which I think, you know, if we look at it from a non-security and defence perspective, are perhaps even positive developments. Huh? Uh, but if we then sort of uh, interpret it through through a security and defence lens, they are not necessarily positive. And what I mean by this is that I think what the pandemic has done has been to change the focus from the external to the internal and from the security to the socioeconomic. Uh, so, you know, 2014, 20, well, up until the pandemic, we were indeed very much focused on the outside. Crises left, right and centre, and internally, ooh, we can't really agree on things that we normally were able to agree on as European Union, you know? uh, Eurozone reform, migration. So on these internal policy questions, there was very deep disagreement. And all of a sudden, agreeing on the external, meaning on the foreign policy, I mean, didn't become exactly easier, uh, easy, but it became easier uh, than on these internal policy questions. So the, the sort of focus went from inside to outside in, in these years. Uh, and much for the same reason, it moved from the, you know, sort of uh, usual subjects of European integration, which is indeed the economic, to the security. And, and I think this explains partly why all of the things that happened over the, that, that period started taking place. COVID essentially reshifts the focus from external to internal, hey, you know, we actually managed to come out with an agreement, which is a pretty significant one uh, on, uh, uh, on the next generation EU, MFF, etc. Um, and which not only represents a very important step in terms of response to the pandemic, but a pretty historic step in terms of the integration process. So the focus is back on the inside and the focus is back on the sort of usual subjects of European integration, meaning away from security and defence and back and back to the socioeconomic. As I said, as a citizen, I would say perhaps even a good thing. Eh? Uh, as, as a foreign policy sort of expert, hmm, you know, slightly, slightly less so. Um, so I think you know, this is what has been happening. Uh, and on top of this, we have then this, uh, this US uh, election, which tends to reinforce uh, the illusion of, hey, not only do we now have all sorts of internal economic questions to deal with, uh, but we have you know, a return to a past in which the external and the security and defense, someone else is going to, to look after. And of course, it is an illusion. Uh, it's an illusion because uh, these are structural transformations. You know, this is not a question of Joe Biden as opposed to Donald Trump as opposed to Barack Obama. Uh, that the world is changing, meaning that we are gradually crystallizing into a different form of a bipolar constellation is, is fairly clear, which doesn't mean to say that well, there will not be other power centers, but they will be inevitably sort of pushed or pulled uh, towards one side or, or the other, uh, that this new uh, structure is going to be not necessarily one of an outright confrontation, but it will be also confrontation in nature. Uh, and there is going to be a sort of political and ideological overlay uh, in terms of what this conf confrontation is, uh, uh, is about. 
This is also, uh, I think, fairly, uh, fairly clear uh, that the United States will be principally preoccupied uh, with, with China uh, is, again, very uh, clear indeed. Uh, and that our own part of the world is going to continue to be extremely uh, messy and conflictual and fragile likewise is also fairly fairly clear. So all of the reasons um, for us to assume greater responsibility are obviously still there. Uh, I think it's going to be extremely important for this message to be sent loud and clear, uh, you know, even if in a slightly more polite way <laughs> than under the, the, the Trump administration. But I think that the clarity uh, should be, you know, sort of just as uh, ju just as much uh, under a Biden administration. And I think that what this ultimately means for us is not only a question of, you know, the way in which we normally frame this debate. We've got to spend more money on defense and we need to have the capabilities. But another element, which, of course, is very important, another element to this is not only the responsibility taking in terms of cost, uh, but also in terms of risk. I mean, many of the things that we have to do in our part of the world, we already have the capabilities to do. We could already be in Libya with a ceasefire monitoring mission and a peace enforcement operation. We don't need to have other capabilities. Uh, we need to be politically willing to assume risk. And of course, risk does come with the risk to life. Huh? Uh, and, and this is the psychological leap that as Europeans, I think we still struggle to make. So I think moving forward, uh, the, 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 our debate about autonomy, which I think has to go hand in hand with this being a precondition for a revamped uh, transatlantic relationship, uh, has to have as its two components, both this element of responsibility, but also this element of risk taking. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, so, so let me continue with you, Sophia. Let's pick up on, on those topics. Um, Natalie said that yeah, Europe has been very good at pushing papers and, and you know, inventing new, inventing new acronyms um, in the in the defense sector. But there is important here to actually to 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 take responsibility and and do the, not only the burden sharing across the Atlantic but also political burden sharing, as it were. Would you would you agree on this? Would I mean I'm probably responsible for a depressing amount of these papers about these acronyms and I was very uh, joyful and optimistic in the beginning but if I zoom in a little bit on the EU defense initiatives where we are now in 2020 broadly I would say that the EU defense push of the last few years has turned into a focus of capability over operations. Um, now you can take a cynical view here and say that we did that because the EU is better at looking out for European industries than it is at engaging in military action. You can also argue that it was a necessary first step. If you don't have the equipment, you're not going to deploy, etc. But now I think I agree with Natalie that we're in a situation where we saw a lot of patting each other on the shoulder and saying, see, we got a whole lot closer to the European Defence Union. We've made unprecedented steps towards supranationalizing defence industrial policy with the EDF and the DG Defence. And we've woken up our sleeping beauties and we've got the MPC and CARD and, and military mobility. And then, you know, the MFF have the budget for many of these initiatives, setting them up to underperform, setting them up to fail in some cases, I would argue. And we still haven't actually become more engaged in securing our neighborhood. And the issues here are well known. I mean, I fully agree with Natalie on the risk taking. Um, I think at the base, there is a lack of shared threat perception. There is a lack of political will. There are things that the EU can do to incentivize member states to do more together. We can reform our decision making structure. We can try to forge a strategic culture through the E21. We can come up with a joint threat analysis through the strategic compass, maybe. Uh, but there's a whole tightly wound bull ball of issues here and just pulling at one threat isn't going to unbind it. I mean, it's boring to have to keep saying it, but it comes down to political will. It comes down to the will of, of risk taking. And I think this is where sort of the US angle comes in now. We had a surge of political will with Trump, um, but then efforts to do more through the EU also clearly suffered from his divide and rule tactic. The optimistic take is that Biden will keep up the pressure, but also be a more benevolent partner. And that perhaps over the next four years, Europeans can take advantage of the fact that they're no longer facing this distraction and division of an adversarial transatlantic relationship and invest the financial and political capital into strengthening their ability to act. 
the pessimistic take is that Europeans are going to relax back into inaction and that we're going to spend another four years debating the meta concept of strategic autonomy. And, you know, for some member states, this may not be a problem, you know, as long as we're discussing meta concepts, you don't actually have to spend any money and you don't actually have to send any troops um, if we just keep coming back to the broad ideas that we apparently disagree on. Um, I mean, briefly, I have nothing innovative to say on strategic autonomy. I think the distinction between a European path and a transatlantic path is misguided. We need to become a more capable defense actor, both to work better with the United States and because at times we will have to go it alone. Um, the Biden administration, I think, will likely be less critical of EU defense efforts, but they're not going to hold our hands through it, you know, and my sense is that they're ready to dismiss everything that doesn't actually result in a more capable Europe. And an interesting question here, um, I think, is the defense industrial side of things. The Trump administration had, say, a, a few more practical concerns about EU defense initiatives that went beyond the traditional 3D um, questions. You know, they thought that uh, the defense initiatives might lead to a defense market that's less open to non-EU companies, that there was a poison pill for the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and, you know, we can have a long discussion about uh, whether this is reciprocity or whether it's protectionism and we can talk about ITAR and um, the third country rules for PESCO and all that. And I'm very happy to talk about these things. I'm sure I'm the only one. But the defense fund has, as I said, been weakened significantly in budget struggles. And so this might be a bit of a non-issue for Biden in the end. Um, finally, I just want to talk briefly about burden sharing. Um, I think there's a risk that... Europeans, in order to overcome their national trauma of the last four years, once more now go ahead and vie for the attention of the new president all individually, rather than approaching the White House as a united front. Um, I think we should use the next four years to try to fortify the transatlantic alliance of only against the next incumbent in the White House in 2024 which might be the last incumbent of the White House, which might be uh, another Trumpist candidate, which might be a left-wing Democratic candidate. You know, we also have to remember that Joe Biden was on the more globalist, internationalist spectrum of the, Democratic, of the Democrats in the US. Um, and, you know, defense, I don't think is actually the most important issue here. It's just the one that I work on. <laughs> and while it might not be the most important for the world, I mean, look at climate and others, I do think that burden sharing has become this sort of entry-level hurdle, this sine qua non. And so we have to address it. Um, we have to talk about it. And there will be, and this has been noted by, by many people, a continued focus on the 2%. The 2%, of course, is going to be easier with shrinking economies post-corona. But still, I think we have to make an offer to the US to try and broaden the burden sharing debate. Um, and as we know, NATO has repeatedly tried to do that, um, different indicators than just the 2%. But I think there might be an opportunity to think about burden sharing new to broaden it even beyond defense capabilities, beyond defense spending. There's um, proposals here to look at, you know, the cost that countries incur from sanctions against Russia, for example, or to look at broader foreign policy efforts, look at what we spend on um, migration policies, on refugee policies, look at what we spend in um, dual use emerging technologies. I think there's a real, I mean, there is some goodwill now on both sides of the Atlantic, and maybe we can uh, we can use that to broaden this debate to make it a bit more constructive uh, going forward. I'll end here for now. Yeah, thank you so much, Sophia. So, so building on, on that, uh, what Sophia said towards the end there, uh, Marianne, if you broaden the scope a little bit, um, and also in the previous previous uh, panel, they were of course talking about you know all the areas where there will be more similarity between the Biden administration and, and Europe on climate and multilateralism and trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, do you see do you see in a broader EU foreign security policy that they, we could engage on the transatlantic uh, on many other dimensions than we have thus far over the last few years, and that the next four years actually bring opportunities in this regard? Yes. yes, thank you, Kirsten. Thanks for having me and thanks for a very good uh, discussion so far. So I think I'll just move on then from uh, Natalie and Sophia and focus on more of the kind of uh, the non-military threats and tools that the EU uh, has and also how this kind of links to the US, China and uh, Russia somehow. Uh, because I think that uh, 
of course, this is a military seminar and we're discussing military issues, but I do think, as Sophia also said, that we really risk underestimating the importance of the EU as a security actor if we don't also discuss its non-military means. And I completely agree that Europe still needs NATO for territorial defense. It needs to do more in dealing with many of the challenges it faces in its neighborhood, perhaps not least in the South and in the Middle East, and Biden will also uh, expect that. Uh, and I think that the EU might also be on its way to do more in this domain, uh, even if such processes, as we know, are often slow, a bit slow in the EU. But I think more, much more importantly, m many, and also Sophia already said that, and Natalie as well, that most of today's security threats and risks are really non-territorial and better dealt with by non-military means, or at least a combination of the two. And I do think, and this is also of course important for Norway as a non-member, that in dealing with such threats, uh, more like a broad, tightly integrated political organization such as the EU has more capacity and often better means uh, than a purely military organization such as NATO. So just to give a few examples, we all know about the use of civilian missions. Uh, of course, it's an important uh, post-conflict role and its comprehensive approach. One example being with uh, Som uh, Somalia, where it combines military means, civilian training and development aid. But I, my impression is that the EU is really also increasingly seeking to increase its resilience against and directly address um, today's perhaps biggest security threats, such as health crisis and pandemics. We have seen how uh, the EU is developing uh, or integrating in response to, uh, to the corona crisis. The climate crisis, of course, but also security issues linked to migration, terrorism, and also these uh, very important security threats that we face linked to cyber attacks and uh, the kind of attempts we see to undermine democracy and the European way of life through systematic disinformation, which we see from Russia, for example. Um, and uh, the EU, as it typically does, the EU is also actively using the international arena to deal with various security threats, uh, climate, but also we also now even see the EU developing a distinct Arctic policy that it works through ASEAN on issues in the South China Sea, it's developing a space policy, it's a strong maritime actor, etc, etc. So I think that even if military means are very easy to focus on and very kind of uh, easy to define and discuss, um, many of today's crises and security threats require a different type of response and a different crisis management uh, tool set, uh, toolkit. Uh, so, um, uh, which is important to help knowledge also for Norway then as a non-EU member state. And um, moving then on to kind of the importance of the US election and also trying, even if this is of course an enormous task, somehow to the uh, Russia-China issue, which the previous panelists uh, have done and also Shingir and Brzezinski earlier today, but it's, I mean, um, if we could try to kind of, as we are doing today, to kind of, kind of uh, 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 break this whole relationship down by looking at the impact of the US elections among, along some of the factors that we know affect the strength of the transatlantic relationship. And that includes both uh, internal uh, factors, uh, uh, to the EU and the US and also these international structure factors that have been mentioned. Uh, and for Europe and uh, Norway, it's uh, Trump and Biden, they have fundamentally different perspectives on foreign policy and the Biden approach and obviously fits much better with the and Norway's perspectives. Um, uh, and as has been mentioned earlier today, that Biden will return to Paris, to the World Health Organization, and uh, start engaging with Iran, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, von der Leyen also said last week that the EU is very uh, stands ready to establish a new transatlantic agenda. And uh, Natalie also pointed to that. But I think, and I agree with all the previous speakers that it's we will not return to the pre-Trump area because the world has changed, geopolitics has changed. And I also think that maybe Trump has changed the relationship more long term because as we know, Trumpism hasn't gone. And I also think that the, perhaps the 
uh, uh, Europe's trust in the US have, has been reduced somewhat because we know that, and Sophia also mentioned that, that uh, US foreign policies may change again in four years. And, uh, um, and also another aspect, of course, is the, that geopolitics have changed. I and mean, we all know that the, the US pivot to Asia started under Obama. Uh, and uh, since China is the, uh, the US main rival, Europe is simply of less relevance to the US today than it has traditionally been since the Second World War. And I think then uh, I agree with all the other speakers that Biden will continue or his administration will continue to push for the EU to take on a bigger responsibility for its own security and perhaps in particular towards the South. And I also think that the US will want support from its allies in dealings with China, also on non-military issues from trade to 5G to the South China Sea. And that this might also be linked to support for uh, support with Russia, Russia. And this, as has also been mentioned earlier, will be a very difficult trade-off for uh, the EU because the EU is still less decided on what kind of policies it will conduct vis-a-vis -vis China. And it needs, of course, the China deal need, for example, the climate crisis and the pandemic. And in a best case scenario would, of course, be if the US, China, the EU, other allies could kind of, or like-minded country could, could deal with these major threats like uh, the corona crisis or uh, climate in kind of institutional settings where it's possible to, to keep these more kind of security and power balancing issues distinct. Um, uh, uh, and also the EU and the US also disagree on um, a number of issues that are also at least indirectly linked to security, such as how to regulate technology firms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And just uh, uh, a final point, uh, even if we focus on um, geopolitics and the importance of geopolitics, the importance of the, the US election, uh, I think, and this is also I've been discussed by my co-panelists, but I think it's very important that we don't reduce EU security policy developments to this kind of bigger power or balancing games, because as we know, EU integration is very much driven by factors internal to the EU, and many of the member states, including France and Germany, uh, are very uh, are strongly in favour of more EU security integration, and this is also, and the ES, the Commission, all of these institutional actors are pushing for more cooperation. And we know now from uh, previous research that crises tend to drive more EU integration, and we also know that once these processes start, they tend to continue. Uh, and uh, some of the issues that the broader security uh, issues that we that Europe needs to deal with are also kind of linked to these uh, supranational community policy areas in the EU, which gives them and the EU institutional also a particularly strong role. Um, and we know that the EU foreign policy has a very strong domestic support in uh, Europe. So um, um, I'll finish, but I mean, so relations between the US, Russia and China are very important for understanding EU security policies, but EU policies, of course, also develop independently of this broader picture. All right. Thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, now we covered uh, the whole spectrum, haven't we? Uh, let me try to follow up and, and bring back um, some of the topics that also Marianne just mentioned. This, you know, the security challenges Europe is facing, it's so broad and it's military and non-military. Uh, and and uh, and uh, there's so many areas to cover, so to speak, and in some of them we can deal with it by ourselves as Europeans and others. We need uh, strong alliances. Now, is there still a risk? Back to this first talk about you know the risk awareness uh, in in Europe, Natalie, that we we kind of want to have a burden sharing in the sense that we wish the Americans to do the military stuff and we can do all the other kind of, we can join up to the soft security things. We can we can be tough on 5G and trade and things like that, but we, we don't have any, as I also was discussed in the previous panel, we don't have much military equipment to start sailing in the, in the Asia Pacific. We can't really support the US and the military dimension as a global player. Uh, is there a risk though that we, Kind of outsource the military to the to the US and and you know focus on the on the less difficult things when you're gonna uh, engage the world. 
Well, yes. I mean, obviously that risk is is there. Um, I mean, I think what's interesting um, is that I'm not even sure the United States expects us to be particularly active militarily in, in the Asia Pacific. I think they would kind of expect us to be a little bit more active closer, closer to home. Uh, and in a sense, the real risk of not doing so um, is you know, has less to do with the United States and has more to do with basically what we've been seeing over the last, you know, pretty much decade now, uh, which is the fact that if the United States is not there uh, and if we are not there and uh, both of these things are increasingly true, then others are. Uh, and we have seen, uh, obviously, you know, sort of Russia first and foremost. We've seen it with Turkey. Uh, we've seen it with Gulf countries. I mean, you know, the others step in. And the question, therefore, to be asked for us is, you know, this is less of a problem for the United States. I mean, you know, the United States does have the luxury to, you know, sort of uh, remain on its side of the Atlantic and deal with its major strategic uh, security threat, which is obviously China related. The consequences of Russia and Turkey and Gulf countries and whatever uh, sort of managing, quote unquote, our neighborhood are ours to pay. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the, 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 the policy problem should really be posed and the political problem should be posed in, in, in those terms. Do we consider it to be a higher cost in all sorts of ways, uh, security and migration and terrorism and energy and climate and uh, economy? Is it a greater cost for us to take the risk not only you know, not take the responsibility not only in terms of money but also taking the risk in terms of body bags uh, coming home or is it a greater risk for these other regional players to deal with these conflicts and fragilities for us in a manner that is counter to our interests ultimately that that is the 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 the, the, the political and the policy question to be posed so it has less to do with the united states and it has far more to do with with us basically yeah what's your take sophia i mean also maybe um brexit we haven't mentioned that but i mean there's so many issues in europe <laughs> uh, that complicates our security and defense environment and are we are we prepared to 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 take that responsibility that is actually needed now uh, to kind of demonstrate for the for the new uh, Biden administration that we we are we, we are actually serious about the transatlantic transatlantic security cooperation. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know that we we are we we should be. Uh, I I think maybe it's really important to distinguish between. Um, and this to me is really where the European strategic autonomy sovereignty question is the most interesting between um, European interests and broader interests, um, interests of the US interest in the transatlantic uh, security cooperation. And to me, this is where I, um, this is how I sort of approach this question, for example, of Europe in the Indo-Pacific, um, where I, or, and I, I'm genuinely not sure whether it's better to, as uh, we heard in the previous panel, uh, have some symbolic deployments there, um, some a symbolic frigate uh, in the Indo-Pacific to um, symbolize our transatlantic partnership, or whether you know um, that just leads to the kind of situation that um, we had with Afghanistan, for example. And this is my. My, maybe my German view, but there were, we had so many issues with deploying uh, in Afghanistan and the narrative was we have to do it for the transatlantic partnership, we have to do it for our American friends. And then you speak to American generals and they say, well, if you're going to come here like this and not actually even do anything, then why are you coming at all? And I think that is sort of the risk with um, following, expecting the United States to set our interests for us, our security interests for us. Um, uh, whether we're, <laughs> I wish we were having a discussion where it was, should we go to the Indo-Pacific or should we be in our neighborhood? Right now, we're not doing either. You know, we we I think we would were we would be sort of ten steps ahead if it was a serious conversation whether um, this kind of geographic burden sharing uh, was actually taking place or not. Mm. 
Okay, I would like to also follow up on another question from the previous panel, which is a little bit more Euro introvert about about values, uh, you know, with, with Turkey, for instance. Okay, and it was mentioned that well, if you have a have a more engaged uh, US uh, US um, diplomatic effort, uh, it would be easier for Europe to deal with, with for instance, Turkey. Uh, but you can also look at other, let's say, uh, illiberal democracies uh, or tendencies in that direction. Um, would would could we expect that that a more let's say coherent value uh, based diplomacy from the US in, in line with let's say majority at least of the European states would would that have a security impact also on Europe uh, would that stabilize and 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 ease the tensions that we that you may see or or is that kind of external interference in our internal affairs as it were uh, Mariana please <laughs> yes, a big question, but thank you. I think that uh, in general, uh, I guess that the EU's kind of long term uh, perspective on how to achieve resilience will always be linked to kind of having a strong multilateral order and a value based multilateral order. That is kind of uh, the, the overall kind of uh, perspective when it comes to these uh, liberal democracies in Europe, which I guess you are alluding to the Poland and Hungary, for example, it's been uh, which I think that the Trump presidency, in a sense, it kind of it's been a, a push towards more EU foreign and policy integration in the sense that Europe understands that it needs to do more. But it has also kind of allowed uh, Poland and Hungary to to do more as they please. Now that Trump is gone, it might be more difficult for them to oppose common EU policies. So. Um, uh, uh, but I just wanted also to follow up, you mentioned Brexit, which is of mm -hmm. course also a very important aspect here because the UK even uh, sometimes reluctantly have, has been very important for the foreign security policy project and it has of course a lot of capabilities and it's a, it's a very competent foreign policy actor. So and now uh, in the negotiations, and I, I guess that Natalie knows much more about this than me, but for now, uh, this has been kind of left uh, outside of the negotiations, what kind of uh, foreign and security policy now relationship uh, the UK should have to the EU after, after uh, uh, Brexit, and also how this is will link to not only the NATO, but all these other foreign and secu or security policy initiatives and cooperation schemes that are going on in Europe, both within and without outside uh, the EU. But uh, I guess having also to discuss with other experts at New uh, amongst other things, that once kind of Brexit is done with, uh, negotiations on how to kind of interlink or link the UK to the EU security architecture will start pretty immediately because I think that is in both parties interest and I also think that this is of course very very important for for Norway but it also links to the US because the US has also kind of uh, expressed an interest in participating in PESCO or uh, the EDF and many of these other kind of uh, uh, cooperation schemes that are uh, developing in Europe and this is also something that the, the EU will have to decide on how to deal with the UK on the one hand if they don't have a strong uh, agreement with uh, Europe and how they will uh, relate to the US. I mean, if they are, if the UK, if they trade with the EU on similar terms, uh, it might be difficult to include the UK in PESCO and not involve the US, for example. But I, I guess I would be interested in hearing other perspectives on that. Thank you, Marianne. Perfect. That's that's a good lineup for me. I could just pass the question on, but I'll, I'll like both of you to, both Sophia and, and Natalie, to respond to this. Actually, the Brexit impact on the on European security and defence architecture in, in the coming years. Uh, so maybe we should do the opposite order. And uh, Sophia, maybe you can go first. What's your take on on uh, take on this? So I'm we're growing more and more um, pessimistic on this question, um, certainly under the current government in the UK, defence and security and foreign policy cooperation has taken an absolute back um, that has lost importance for them, I'd say, with the EU. Um, I can 
I don't think we're going to see the kind of ambitious security and defense um, plug-in agreement that some were advocating for under the May government. Um, I think the two scenarios are either we don't have an agreement at all and we're going to try and go ahead uh, in coalitions of the willing, possibly uh, ad hoc cooperation, or um, we're going to have sort of a range of, of mini agreements um, with the institutional structures. But I just don't see the interest in uh, London at the moment to engage um, on that kind of institutional level with the EU. Um, there's a sort of dismissive sense of EU defense initiatives. And, you know, sometimes I, I understand what they're getting at. I mean, I think once we're at a level where discussions have become so incredibly technical that the capitals aren't even uh, engaged anymore, there's a question of uh, where are we going to where are we going to go with it. Of course, that's a bad thing for the EU. I mean, or for Europe broadly, there's no point in fighting with one hand tied behind our back. You know, there's of course we've we've all made these arguments before about the the capabilities that uh, UK brings to the table, the expertise that the UK brings to the table, the diplomatic connections, um, and also in the relationship with the US. But um, I think it's going to be really interesting how the UK deals with um, the transatlantic, with this transatlantic connection that it has with regards to the European defense efforts, whether they're going to try to ingratiate themselves with a Washington that is skeptical of European defense efforts or whether they're going to try and play a more constructive link um, in advocating for some of the defense efforts that Europe is uh, trying to do. Hmm. Um, Natalie, uh, nonetheless, I mean, uh, uh, European defense without the UK is really nothing. Uh, well, it's limited. Far, very at least reduced a lot. So I mean, realistically speaking, Europe has to come to terms with, with the UK at some stage, right? To to, uh, to to really to find a way to integrate or at least cooperate. I mean, uh, with the British security and defence dimension. Well, I mean, to be honest, I think the British have to come to terms with themselves first. Uh, and, and, and until and unless they do, uh, it is very difficult to have to even begin a sort of rational conversation about all of this. I mean, you know, let's not forget that, you know, setting aside the security and defense question, we are what, a few days away from, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, missing a deadline on an agreement that kind of everyone knows what it is. Huh? And we still don't know whether the British government is going to move forward at a time in which, I mean, not only would the economic costs of not doing so be great anyway, but at a time in which the United Kingdom is going through its kind of, you know, worst recession uh, since the 1930s. So, I mean, if, if there is any rationality to this, I mean, set aside the security and defense question, then, I mean, I personally don't see it. Now, you know, having said this, so I, I share Sophia's pessimism, you know, I mean, if we're there on the economic front, let alone on, on security and defense. Having said that, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, you know, sooner or later, uh, rationality will return. Uh, it will have to return. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be the moment in which one can have, you know, that sort of, um, I don't know whether it's in one, two, three or ten years, uh, but at some point it will it, it, it will be backed, you know, and um, the United Kingdom is not going anyway, anywhere. I mean, it is where it where it is. And all of the reasons that, you know, have been uh, discussed as to why it is in the mutual interest of, uh, of both to, to sort of to come to uh, all sorts of practical and eventually institutional arrangements will, will be there. Uh, but it's not I don't think that as European Union now, this is our call to make, you know, I mean, uh, we will, I mean, I think, you know, we can't sort of stop and wait. Uh, we have to continue doing what we have to do, uh, which we have to do regardless of what happens in the United States, as we were saying earlier, or what happens uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and, and, and as and once we do what we have to do, uh, we can only sort of, you know, wait for the moment in which there will be someone on the other side of the channel uh, to have a sort of rational conversation about this in the same way as now we have someone on the other side of the Atlantic with whom to have a rational conversation about all of this. Mm. Uh, we have we have two minutes left. I would like you to be very brief, each one of you, to tell us to, to, to share with the audience what is the most important thing that thing that Europe should do now with engaging with the US 
uh, for the next four years. Uh, I'll start with you, Marianne, and go in reverse order. So very briefly, what's the most important things that Europe should do towards the US? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I guess it's uh, working on getting the US back to the table. I think that it's kind of, it says a lot that this corona crisis and the US lack of leadership, it's the first time that the United States has not taken the lead in dealing with an international global crisis since the second world war as i mean with 9-11 the financial crisis it's always been the u.s taking lead together with europe so i guess it's just uh, as I, as was mentioned by the first panel if you look at uh the uh, uh, discussions and uh, comments made by the biden administration during the campaign and also after the the elections uh, foreign policy does not seem to be its uh, first priority. Of course, not. It's the U.S. is facing a polarized and very uh, society in, uh, with the face, um, with the pandemic. But I think just getting the, all of these processes started again that would be the main thing that uh, the EU needs to do. All right, Sophia. Europe's most important tasks towards Washington. Well, I, I mean, I'd have to say it's. It's climate, it's arms control and getting ahead of surveillance uh, technology, the use of surveillance technology by industry and governments. But in the more narrow defense uh, field, I think it's broadening the defense burden sharing question and get it on more constructive ground. Excellent. The two new topics there for next seminar, <laughs> technology and uh, Nathalie, please. Um, I would say um, demonstrating our readiness to take responsibility in practice. So pick, I don't mind which crisis, it can be Libya, it can be Belarus, I mean, you know, so that we've got plenty. Uh, just pick one and demonstrate that we are actually able to take the lead uh, and work and coordinate with the United States, uh, but with us being uh, at the steering wheel. All right, excellent. Then we'll wait and see and, and see how that uh, this, if, if they're listening to you, if this is going to happen, it will be very interesting to see. I'm, I'm sorry time is up. Uh, we could have talked much longer. So I would like to, to thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts and reflections with us today. It's been really, really, really interesting.